Hey guys, welcome back to Rocket again, my fellow space tubers. And today we are back here again to see the Atlas V USSF 12 mission. Right now, we are at a planned hold at T minus 4 minutes or H minus 4 minutes, as they like to say. And uh, uh, things are um, again, uh, um, you know, nom 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 not so good today uh, we do have some sort of opportunity at the start of the window but as the weather uh, launch window progresses the thing just uh, you know this is the mission profile will come to that but things just uh, uh, will deteriorate okay right now the uh, whether the weather is 50% go for the launch it was 40% initially it has improved 50% at the start of the launch and by the end of the window it is 20% go for the launch so whatever has to happen has to happen during the start and uh, we are hoping that <laughs> we get to see this launch today so welcome to the stream Baba Yara, Andrew Crawl, Rocket Launch Mania, Stargazer and Luli how are you all? <clears throat> yep uh, yeah so regarding the driving test yes i aced that so uh, yes it went well thank you so much for asking so yes <coughs> talking about this mission again we already know all those things about this mission but let's just have a, a quick look uh, at those things again let me just so yeah this is the atlas 5 ula's rocket uh, and this is a very unique rocket in a, some sense because it uses different propellant for the first stage and the second stage the first stage is this one which is kind of copper gold color then it has this uh, uh, four solid rocket boosters so the config which is flying today is 541 five means the uh, five meter fairing which is a longer fairing which is the longest fairing in the world okay uh, then we have the four uh, 4 signifies those 4 solid rocket boosters which are attached to it and then we have 1, 1 means there is 1 centaur up, uh, upper engine which is going to fly today. So uh, <clears throat> let's have a quick look at the rocket uh, too. So we have here the rocket, just a sec, there you go. Okay, cool. So this is the <coughs> Atlas 5541 configuration. It has 
the four solid rocket boosters and uh, this these are uh, this is a single engine rd 180 engine which is going to uh, propel the first stage this first stage is powered by rp1 and locks as its fuel and uh, it's, it runs on stage combustion cycle which is a very high efficient cycle because it is a closed cycle now talking about the second stage this is the four uh, these are the four solid rocket boosters so talking about the second stage uh not like this but this yeah this is good so the second stage is powered by a single centaur engine which runs on uh, liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen as its fuel and it is the most capable upper stage right now flying uh you can take this in writing from from me because this is the first stage with the upper stage which has done incredible jobs till date uh, with all the missions being bullseye sent uh, you know uh, uh, missions to the mars to the moon and whatnot uh, and will be uh, this will also assist in um, assist lunar economy when the artemis uh, program will uh, start to happen so uh, yes this is the rocket now let's have a look at the payloads that we have today so regarding the payloads uh, so uh, this is already 180 engine as i have already told you this is not uh, two engine this th these are not two engine this is just a one in single engine which has one single turbo pump which you can see in here and which and it has two uh, combustion chambers and uh, as i said before too this helps the power distribution or you can say not the power actually the pressure distribution and pressure and the temperature distribution which is built up in the combustion chamber so rather than having like a single uh, person to handle all those uh, you know pressure extreme pressure and temperature we have like two people doing that job so they, they there you have that and now this is the satellite which is flying today so this is the wild field of view test bed satellite it is um uh, you know this is <coughs> sorry this will be capable of performing strategic and tactical missions such as battle space awareness and missile warning and directly supporting war uh, war fighters by monitoring earth surface respectively so this mission is from department of defense this wild field of view test bed is also from a department of defense and that is the reason why all those you know missiles and everything is here so this will play an important role for the missile warning tracking and defense architecture so this is uh, this weighs around three tons uh, and uh, the payload the instrument of uh, you know the scientific instruments or the you know working instruments weighs around 350 kilograms and it has two solar panels and uh, it has a mission life of three to five years in orbit the next two ones okay so this is how it looks like when it is uh, fully deployed the two solar panels the uh, the monitoring system in here the antenna and uh, yeah this is again the solar panel so this is how it looks like now moving on to the next one this is a ussf 12 ring spacecraft and we have already seen the cubesat deployers which flies in transporter mission the d-orbit nano racks and whatnot but this is a unique one because uh, this one is also a deployer but this one is a proper satellite deployer and it has its own propulsion system the power system communication system and it has like six slots where the payload can be hosted or the satellites can be hosted and each slot can carry around 350 kilograms of a satellite so that is really very cool and this is a mission concept right now and once if it is successful that would open doors for you know uh, having many 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 satellites uh, like these ones 350 kilograms all those uh, satellites in just one uh, uh, launch without having to worry about uh, deployer systems and what whatnot the ride share mission is only possible okay just a second yeah so the ride share mission is only able to launch because we have deployers in there okay those transporter mission which we have a cubesat deployed in there so if we have something similar for the larger satellites uh, for like 350 kilograms then it would make much more sense for them to be right share too and thereby decreasing the cost uh, so this is the patch we have and uh, yeah regarding the mission update let's see what do we have in here uh okay 
और जो एक्सेप्टेबल वेदर बिगनिंग ऑफ द लॉन्च विंडो हैज इम्प्रूव्ड टू 60 परसेंट विच इज ग्रेट फ्रॉम 40 टू 60 परसेंट बट इट विल डेटोरेट एज द लॉन्च विंडो प्रोग्रेस सो विल हैव टू वेट एंड सी सो आई थिंक दे आर लाइव नाउ एंड आई विल स्विच ओवर टू दैट कवरेज जस्ट वेट अ सेकेंड Unfortunately, it looks like we're going to have to wait a little bit longer. Mother Nature isn't entirely cooperating right now. My colleagues at the 45th Weather Squad are actively actively evaluating those 10 lightning launch commit criteria to ensure we keep that rocket safe from both natural and rocket triggered lightning. And one of those rules, the attached anvil cloud rule, is currently being violated. However, there are signs that those clouds are beginning to clear over the pad, and we will be in a go situation just before T0. But we'll continue to activate, uh, evaluate those clouds all the way up until the final few seconds of the count. Now, a live look at satellite imagery behind me shows those widespread clouds cover across the spaceport. But the deepest clouds, the strongest showers and thunderstorms, are well west of Complex 41. And the clouds that you see over Cape Canaveral right now are beginning to fit thin, so that's why we're very confident going into today's opening of the window, and we do look we do look good. Jessica Williams just gave her final weather brief at L minus 30 minutes and gave a 60% chance of go or 40% chance of no go conditions due to the cumulus cloud and attached anvil rules. Now, although Mother Nature isn't cooperating right now, we do expect her. To cooperate here shortly, and we should be good to go at the opening of the window. Andrea, back to you. Thanks, Will. There you go. Wind can play a critical role on launch day. ULA has a team of engineers making sure we maximize our launch opportunities with real-time wind monitoring and trajectory updates. To learn more, we spoke with Robert Olson. Uh, hey, Kevin. Uh, so this is the last launch of I for one. I. I actually don't know about it, but if it is so, please, 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 uh, just enjoy the every bit of this uh, launch phase. The law for us, and as part of that, we develop a steering algorithm for the vehicle to steer into the wind to minimize vehicle responses, and we're also verifying that the vehicle is structurally capable and can control itself flying through the wind. The team of engineers shows up here about four hours prior to launch. We have our first balloon release. We're trending the winds aloft conditions on launch day, and for each of those balloons, we see is the vehicle structurally capable, and can it control itself flying through those winds aloft, and what are the performance impacts from flying through those winds aloft? It's critically important for these low-margin, high-performing type of systems that we have a very deep understanding of exactly what the vehicle is going to experience, and in so doing, we're increasing our reliability and the confidence that we have in what the vehicle is going to experience. We're going to ensure that the vehicle is not going to fail in the very dynamic lower portion of the atmosphere on its way to orbit. Yep, that is the reason why. What is unique okay. about this operation here in the Winds Room as well is that we are extremely agile in what we're doing because we have the capabilities to adapt to later balloons in the air and still meet our timeline for whatever T zero the entire launch team is working. It's very important for us here to balance reliability and launch availability. Reliability would be having the most amount of margin possible and protecting the vehicle in that way, while that would be in direct conflict with being able to launch at any given time. So we're balancing that here with the way that we operate with the balloons. We have many balloons in succession, very close to liftoff, and that allows us to provide that balance of launch availability and reliability. That is something really cool. Just as we went on air, the hold was extended. We will be unable to enter terminal count as the appointed time at six o'clock p.m. Eastern liftoff time. Okay, so there you ULA go. ULA is launching USS F-12 for the Space Force's Space Systems Command. Let's learn more from Government Mission Integration Manager Lieutenant Paige Harrison. USS F-12 features two satellite payloads. The wide field of view test bed, as well as the USS F-12 frame, Atlas V will deliver both spacecraft directly to geosynchronous orbit, approximately 22,000 miles or 36,000 kilometers above the equator. 
The Ford Payload Wide Field of View is a testbed spacecraft that informs the next-gen overhead persistent infrared program. The successor for the Space Based Infrared System program, or SIBRS for short. Designed to provide a resilient space-based global missile warning capability against emerging missile and counter space threats. Wide Field of View's primary mission is to explore future missile warning algorithms with data collected in space. The aft payload is a propulsive ESPA called the USSF-12 ring. This ring is a classified mission to demonstrate future technology for the Department of Defense. For today's launch, ULA is using an Atlas V 541 rocket. This is the 94th Atlas V launch and ULA's 151st launch. Produced in ULA's 1.6 million square foot production facility in Decatur, Alabama, the Atlas V Common Core Booster is powered by an NPO Energobosch RD-180 engine. Four Northrop Grumman solid rocket boosters provide additional thrust at liftoff. The Centaur second stage is powered by an Aerojet Rocketdyne RL-10 engine. The two spacecraft are encapsulated in a 5-meter diameter payload fairing produced by Beyond Gravity in Decatur, Alabama. These rocket components travel from Alabama to Cape Canaveral on ULA's rocket ship. Once in Florida, a series of events lead to today's countdown. We're here outside the Vertical Integration Facility, or VIF, at Space Launch Complex 41, where we're about to roll the Atlas V on the mobile launch platform, or MLP, to the pad. Before we do, let's take a look at how we stack this rocket. Our process began with lifting the 107-foot or 33-meter booster onto the MLP. Then the team mated the SRBs to the booster, followed by the transportation and lift of the Centaur into position atop the Atlas V booster. Finally, the payload fairing with both spacecraft already encapsulated was mated to the Atlas V rocket. With the rocket fully assembled, we now transition to the final countdown procedure by rolling it from the VIF to the pad. To complete this move, six components are used for the 20-minute trip, which spans about one-third of a mile. The MLP weighs approximately 2 million pounds, supports the rocket, and contains air conditioning, electrical, and commodities lines. The undercarriages bear the weight of the MLP in the rocket. The Atlas V rocket stands 196 feet, or about 60 meters, and weighs 775,000 pounds, or more than 350,000 kilograms fully fueled. With the rocket on the pad, the launch team transitions to fueling and other final preparations. Okay, th that was a bit weird. We have an update on the weather. I'm going to hand it back to Will for a status. Hey, Andrea. Just wanted to give a quick update because I just heard from my colleagues at the 45th Weather Squadron over at the Morell Operations Center that the estimated clear time on that one rule that we've been monitoring, the attached anvil rule, is going to last a little longer. So we are going to have to eat into today's window. And those clouds that you see over the spaceport are remaining a little bit thicker than we originally anticipated. So that attached anvil cloud rule is not expected to clear until 6.15 p.m. local. Now, we still anticipate going into a go situation here shortly thereafter. So we still have plenty of time within that two-hour window to get today's launch off the ground. Back to you. All right. So we ULA's have... ULA's Atlas V 541 okay. rocket is launching both spacecraft to geosynchronous orbit. Let's learn more about today's flight. The RD-180 main engine and four solid rocket boosters ignite to lift the Atlas V rocket away from the pad. Together, the main engine and SRBs generate a combined liftoff thrust of two and a quarter million pounds, or about 10 mega newtons. The Atlas V reaches Mach 1 at the speed of sound at 35 seconds. One minute, 48 seconds into flight, the first two GEM-63 solid rocket boosters are jettisoned. The remaining two are jettisoned about three seconds later. At approximately 3 minutes, 25 seconds, the rocket is climbed above the densest part of Earth's atmosphere, and the payload fairing is jettisoned. 4 minutes, 24 seconds into flight, propellant levels are depleted, and the main engine shuts down. 6 seconds later, the Atlas Centaur separation system activates to release the booster stage. The rocket now weighs a little more than 5% of what it did at liftoff. At 4 minutes, 40 seconds, the first Centaur main engine burn begins. Following a 12-minute, 15-second coast, the second Centaur main engine burn begins. Within this sequence, the second burn is used to raise the apogee to a near geosynchronous altitude. 5 hours, 43 minutes, 54 seconds after liftoff, 
the RL-10 engine ignites for a final burn. Nearly two and a half minutes later, Centaur completes its final engine cutoff following a guidance-commanded shutdown. The first of two spacecraft separations occurs at 5 hours, 49 minutes, 36 seconds, releasing wide field of view for the Space Force's Space Sensing Directorate. At 5 hours, 59 minutes, 3 seconds, Centaur releases the booster adapter. 6 hours, 5 minutes, 21 seconds after liftoff, Centaur releases the USSF-12 Ring spacecraft for the Space Systems Command Innovation and Prototyping Directorate. All right, uh, so we will be on a hold at T minus four minutes because uh, obviously we are not going to have a clear weather at the start of the launch window. So as he said, 6.15 p.m. is when we start to anticipate a, you know, thinner layer of cloud uh, over the launch pad. So right now things are looking good the centaur upper stage and basically the first stage and the second stage is fully fueled uh, that is what uh, atlas 5 you know ula does basically they don't uh, wait till the end like spacex uh, to top off the fuel they they are those uh, you know um, tanks are fully fueled right now and they are just topping it off which means whatever uh, fuel is wasted in uh, uh, becoming gas that is refilled okay so what i was saying that uh, today's broadcast was somewhat somewhat uh you know unusual i would say because uh we we are you know uh, used to hear the host i i don't know his name but yeah a male ho host basically and uh, uh it was a very very what should i say a kind of unusual to hear her voice basically the problem was uh, what i found was uh, like like she was reading a script that was the main thing and i didn't like that so yeah okay hi fly in the bug <laughs> did you get some sleep and did you pass my so uh, i um, kind of you can say i did get some sleep but again yes insomnia gang hey pratim we uh i will not get the sleep today and yes i passed my driving license exam so there you have it so why am i saying uh, i won't sleep today first of all for this launch uh not so sure when this will uh you know end or will it be a scrub or will it be a launch we'll have to wait and see and then tomorrow uh, in just like um What's the time right now? Yeah, so uh, six hours from now, we are anticipating a Virgin Orbit launch. So Virgin Orbit had a scrub due to some uh, sensor issue previously, but now, um, yeah. Let's get an update on Vulcan. Vulcan Centaur production begins with aluminum sheets expertly machined to remove more than two thirds of the weight resulting in the structurally strong yet lightweight ortho grid panels that form Vulcan's propellant tanks. The panels are then bump pressed to form the curves required to complete the tanks. I so great. Same time, rings, I so adapters, great. and other structural components are precision milled. Next, the aluminum domes, panels, and other structures that form Vulcan's propellant tanks are first cleaned and etched to a smooth, even surface, and then anodized to harden prevent corrosion. Following an ultrasonic inspection, five completed panels for the liquefied natural gas, or LNG tank, are assembled and joined together using friction stir welding. Unlike traditional welding, where filler material is used to join components, friction stir welding uses a head to stir the metal of the two panels together as it moves down the seam. The resulting joint is stronger and produces a lighter weight, higher performing tank. The process is repeated to create the liquid oxygen, or LOX tank, followed by attaching domes to complete the tanks. Circumferential friction stir welding is then used to join the two propellant tanks that comprise the Vulcan booster. As production continues on the booster stage, stretch forming gore panels for the Centaur second stage propellant tanks is underway. The stainless steel gore panels are welded together to create the propellant tank domes. 
The Gore Welder is one of several highly specialized welding stations in the Centaur production process. Just down the aisle, Centaur 5's massive intermediate bulkhead is mated to its ultra-thin tank. Once both propellant tanks are welded, they're mated together to create the Centaur 5 second stage. Once the propellant tanks are joined, the 5.4 meter booster is sprayed with foam insulation before moving to final assembly. Twin BE4 engines are hot fired and then mated to Vulcan's thrust structure. With production complete, the booster makes its way onto ULA's rocket ship for its journey to the launch site. What did he say, twin BE4 Meanwhile, engines? At Cape Canaveral Space Launch Complex 41, the water suppression system has been upgraded and tested, along with other modifications, including new, larger fuel storage tanks. In the Vertical Integration Facility, or VIF, platforms have been modified to accommodate the larger Vulcan rocket. Following the eight-day journey to Cape Canaveral, the booster is offloaded and transported to the VIF, where it is lifted onto the newly constructed Vulcan Launch Platform, or VLP. The first Vulcan booster then travels a third of a mile to the pad for testing, followed by 2.7 miles to the Space Light Processing Operations Center, or SPOC, for additional testing. This launch site testing culminates with another trip to the pad, where the locks and LNG tanks will be filled and chilled to flight levels and temperatures. And people say ULS PR is bad. Man, I I must say, and you also should admit this, that ULS PR is the best of all. SpaceX is also uh, is one step behind ULA. ULA has done such a great thing for improving their PR, but People just don't notice it. Today's artwork includes projection of the world in the center as viewed from space, reflecting a wide field of view as seen through a wasp's eyes. Additionally, there are two black stars inside a red plume to represent the two space vehicle programs. Hey, cool, and thank you so much uh, for the congratulations. Really appreciate it. And yes, I did that. But yes, I have to get a nap. I am like feeling so sleepy because I haven't been able to sleep for like three days in a row now. And today also I won't be sleeping properly because I have to get up early tomorrow to cover the Virgin Orbit launch. And I'm not so sure whether this launch will happen today because the weather is not so green. Okay, anyways, uh, I'll try my best to give you all the insights and cover it for you. Uh, but uh, I heard BE4 engines in that presentation, but I don't, you know, like he said twin BE4 engines are mated to the, um, okay, so he was actually, you know, okay, okay, I got it now. Cool, got it. So he was actually uh, those th that video which you just saw was not of Atlas V but was of Vulcan Center. Vulcan Center. So uh, that is the reason why the B4 was mentioned there. And yes, the isograde structure and all the that uh, proper fabrication process of the tanks and the whole rocket is always a delight to watch. And uh, let me just tell you that Centaur upper stage is so freaking thin that uh, it has to have a proper support otherwise it will just get crushed with uh, on its own weight from its own weight so that is the level of uh, you know uh, thickness of those uh, tanks they are known as balloon tanks because they are very 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 thin so yeah that is the case and that is the reason why we have uh, uh, the upper stage of the centaur inside this five meter fairing because uh, when you have this uh, excess thrust coming in from behind like the uh, excess solid rocket boosters that we have for today uh, the centaur is not able to hold its weight the hold it's uh, uh, hold on to that acceleration which it will uh, get because of that so um uh, uh, that is the reason why uh, it is in enclosed inside that fairing so that uh, certain support structures those rings are there which helps in weight distribution so that uh, the centaur did, does not collapse on itself yeah there you go uh so still waiting in for some updates let me just see if we have any other updates and i'll tell you 
what's the weather looking like right now okay so we remain in the hold at t minus four minutes a new target launch time has not been determined yet because we are waiting for those clouds which you can see right now we want those clouds to go away go away rain rain go away come again another day that's what we say right now uh in when we were kids right but today what we want is clouds clouds go away come back never come back in florida <laughs> florida is like uh you know um cursed with all those uh clouds rains and unpredicted and um, unscheduled rains and weather uh, horror all those things right okay never mind so uh yeah that was one thing we have not they have not been they have not determined the uh, launch time yet any other update i'm still looking in for Um, nope. Cool. So right now, can you hear the rocket noises? I can't. I'm not so sure. Now you can hear somewhat. So the rocket noises are always um good to hear. Those are if you if you are uh, watching this stream and hear those rocket noises and you know uh, let me just tell you one thing that if you are unable to sleep someday. Okay, uh, then just hear these rocket noises, uh, the rocket venting from the pad. That will help you calm down and you will be able to sleep properly. That is the case. Th those, those rocket noises are so soothing. But let me just tell you, rocket itself is not so soothing at all. When the rocket lifts off, it's a controlled explosion that you are playing with. So the, the rumble, the vibrations are intense. And let me just tell you this fact, if you don't know, that if you are, uh, you know, very near to the launch pad, then uh, uh, when and when the rocket lifts off, you may get killed, not because of the heat, not because of um, um, you know, some uh, uh, all those vibrations or whatnot, but you will get killed because of the sound. The sound is so, so, so loud. That uh, you may get killed when you are near the launch pad, near the rocket, basically during the lift off. So, yeah, that rumble when the rocket lifts off is a thing to note down because uh, whenever a person who sees the rocket launch, he or she always remembers it uh, throughout his or her lifetime because it shakes you from within. That rumble shakes you from within. And then you realize, yes, we have, uh, you know, made uh, our humanity progress so far that now we are sending something to space, Mars, Moon, interplanetary, in to, addition to even to solar, game, outside, of, Cloud, outside of solar system. We are also monitoring wind. As we learned in the earlier video, a series of weather balloons has been launched throughout the countdown from the range weather station at the Cape to collect measurements of wind speeds and directions to determine if conditions aloft violate the controllability or structural loads on the rocket during ascent. The balloon data is transmitted to ULA engineers in Denver to select a steering profile that minimizes launch vehicle responses. ULA builds Atlas, Delta, and now Vulcan rockets in a 1.6 million square foot facility in Decatur, Alabama. Here's a look inside. That's the secret. Uh, Successfully launching missions every spot. planet in the solar system, in addition to critical national security, science, weather, and communication satellites, ULA has established a long standing industry reputation for reliability and orbit accuracy. While our rockets lift off from launch pads in Florida and California, the journey to space begins in Decatur, Alabama. At approximately 1.6 million square feet, 
ULA's production facility is an always-on workhorse where technicians simultaneously build components for Atlas V, Delta IV Heavy, and Vulcan Centaur rockets. Booster production begins when large aluminum plate stock is loaded into one of four double gantry skin milling machines where aluminum is milled into patterns designed for building tanks and other components. This process helps reduce the original weight of each panel by 70% while maintaining approximately 75% of the original material strength. After machining, Skin panels are transported to the brake form and bump pressed into the precise curb radius required to create fuel tank barrel sections. Components made from aluminum require anodization to protect from corrosion. For this requirement, certain components like skin panels are first given a high pressure wash and then dipped in a series of chemicals to complete the sealing process. Skin panels are then transported to the vertical friction stir welder where they are lifted and forged together to form the barrel sections of the fuel and oxidizer tanks. Delta IV and Vulcan Centaur tanks are comprised of five skin panels, while four skin panels form the Atlas V tanks. Friction stir welding is a unique process accomplished by a pin tool, which applies frictional heat and stirring of the parent material to form a weld. This process only uses friction as the heat source and has no filler material, making an extremely strong welded joint. Completed aluminum barrel sections then move to the circumferential friction stir welder, where domes are welded to each end, completing the first stage fuel tanks. After pressure testing, which verifies the integrity of the welds, the next stop for booster fuel tanks is the spray-on foam insulation booth, or SOFI. This is where completed tanks are primed, then insulated to protect from the acoustics that occur at liftoff. Tanks then move to final assembly, where components like wiring and engines are added. In addition to the first stage, or booster stage, ULA's second stages are also built in Decatur. The factory has recently undergone a major reconfiguration, resulting in a new state-of-the-art Centaur 5 production line to increase the speed at which Vulcan Centaur's second stages are built, assembled, and tested. The Centaur upper stages for Atlas and Vulcan are built using a thin stainless steel structure, making it the most efficient upper stage currently in use. To create the domes or bulkheads for Centaur's two tanks, gores or pie-shaped sheets are welded together. The bulkheads and tank skins are then assembled using a combination of spot and seam welds. Spray-on foam insulation, or SOFI, is then applied to the Centaur tank to provide thermal protection for the cryogenic fuels. Centaur's tanks are known as pressure-stabilized tanks because 90% of their weight and structure at launch is from the mass of the fuel and oxidizer loaded prior to liftoff. The Centaur tank then moves to final assembly, where engines, avionics, pneumatic, and propulsion systems are installed. At the end of the production journey, all systems on both the booster and Centaur are fully tested, and the stages are prepared for transport to the launch site. With testing and transport preparations completed, Atlas V, Delta IV Heavy, and Vulcan Centaur rockets exit the factory and roll about a mile down the road to a dock on the Tennessee River. Once loaded onto the RS rocket ship, ULA's specially designed cargo boat, the rockets begin the eight-day trip to Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, Florida, or the 23-day trip to Vandenberg Space Force Base, California. Okay, so yes, Blue Traveler, uh, Smarter Every Day did a great tour of the rocket factory, and yes, Tori being Tori, the launch team continues assisted to track him greatly. Ish issues. Anvil clouds remain unacceptable for flight, and the most recent upper level wind reading was red. Let's get an update from Will Ulrich. Thanks, Andrea. The waiting game continues. First, let's talk about the attached anvil rule. Live look at satellite imagery right now continues to show upper level clouds streaming over the spaceport. And those clouds, although they are thinning, 
they remain situated directly over complex 41, so they're taking a little bit more time to get out of the way. With that in mind, my colleagues at the 45th Weather Squadron have updated the estimated clear time to no earlier than 6.30 p.m. this evening, so we're gonna have to wait a little bit longer. Additionally, upper level winds are currently unfavorable. And it's not that those winds are particularly strong because at this time of year, winds are typically very light from the surface all the way through the upper portions of the atmosphere, but they are variable. So flight teams in Denver and with other units inside of United Launch Alliance are keeping a close eye on the changeability or variability of those wind speeds to ensure that the rocket makes the correct adjustments as it moves up into the atmosphere. So with that said, we're not gonna go any earlier than 6.30 p.m., but the general trend is our friend as those clouds continue to thin and move out of the way. We'll provide an update as soon as I have one. Back to you, Andrea. Okay, so there you have it, guys, uh, the Thanks, update. Will. This May, ULA lifted the Boeing Starliner capsule for NASA, marking our 150th launch since our doors opened in 2006. Let's take a look at some highlights commemorating this milestone. Okay, that was something, you know. 150. 150 consecutive launches. 150 consecutive successes. At ULA, 100% mission success is an achievement that both defines us and motivates us. As the industry's most experienced launch service provider, we continue to provide world-leading reliability, schedule confidence, and mission optimization. And we're proud to lead the way in space to expand what's possible on Earth. Our pride is built on the successful launch of 93 national security missions, 18 GPS satellites, five trips to Mars, 18 commercial missions, and 39 science and exploration missions. From low Earth to the most complex geosynchronous orbits and interplanetary trajectories, ULA is the only launch provider capable of delivering to any orbit, any time. 30 Delta IIs, 23 Delta IVs, 12 Delta IV heavies, 85 Atlas Vs, 150 flights using our trusted fleet of rockets built to the evolving needs of each and every customer. We've traveled 2,500,000 miles and delivered more than 1,400,000 pounds to orbit, deliveries that have improved the way we live and work and provided a deeper understanding of our universe. All rockets are not created. When it absolutely must get to space safely and on time, customers choose ULA. 150 glorious liftoffs, 100% mission success. Okay, that was not uh, related to Star uh, Starliner at all. There was some miscommunication there, but. Uh, that was quite a flex, I must say, but uh, they can flex also because they have uh, achieved all those things. So, yeah, why not flex about it, right? So, <coughs> sorry. So, I was saying that, uh, uh, yes, the, the cloud is a problem here. The clouds are a problem here. Uh, and along with the clouds, the winds are also, uh, upper level winds are also a problem. That is actually manageable. Upper level winds are manageable. The problem with the winds are, as he said, they are variable, which means uh, they are uh, not constant. And that, and because of that, uh, the team, the, you know, the mission profile team, the launch team, they need to determine the proper trajectory so that uh, um, the rocket is does not face a rud right during the liftoff uh, and uh, during its mission so those variable winds actually uh, does not provide them a proper uh, data to uh, see for themselves like uh, what corrections in the software needs to be done so that the uh, rocket can have a smooth ride to the orbit so um, yeah so uh, the update right now is the countdown clocks are holding at t minus 4 and we have not yet selected a resumption time. Inclement weather conditions at Cape have prevented a launch of Atlas V. 
thus far tonight but the team is uh, postured to resume the count if we get a break with the clouds and the winds aloft so there you go winds and clouds are a problem and let me just tell you uh, they will have to launch it very early in this during the start of the launch window because by the end of the launch window the weather is supposed to go down from 50 percent go 60 percent go for the launch to 20 percent go for the launch and obviously you don't want that so weather gods are still not uh, happy with us that's for sure uh, maybe uh, and yes they are twice as angry today <laughs> because uh, <coughs> yesterday by the end of the window the the you know uh, weather was slightly improving we were getting some hopes at all at all uh, if not but uh, today that is not the case so we'll have to wait and see And I'm feeling so sleepy right now. I am unable to properly speak also because of those of that sleep and tiredness I've been facing from three days in a row now. And let me tell you that uh, I have to move out in just two days. So, okay, uh, that is something.
questions about the various clock displays visible in the Launch Control Center. Most notably, the T count and the L count clocks. T simply stands for time and L for launch. The T count is a scripted time until T0. All of the launch vehicle countdown events are procedurally sequenced to T time. The L count is the total amount of time until launch, which is the T time plus the built in holds. Built in holds are placed at strategic points in the countdown. For instance, before cryogenic loading and before the terminal count and liftoff, and are contingency time that the team can use if needed to catch up in the event of a delay in countdown activities. Alright, so we are looking good for 6.30 p.m. That's what, um, you know, the update suggests. The Cape Weather team indicates a few additional minutes will likely be needed beyond the expected 6.30 p.m. clear time for the anvils. So, can it be said that, uh, said that this one is a good sign or is it just extending the time? seems like an extending one but let's see so we are still at t minus four minutes and holding due to weather still the weather goods gods are not so good for us today okay so what else do we have up nope, nothing so yeah still uh the it was previously at 6 p.m the liftoff was scheduled and then it was 6.15 until things can go alright then now it was and then it was 6.30 but now it says addition, additional minutes LD, LD channel 1 after LD. okay LC load contingency address file address underscore AV 094 underscore 07 SPLCRC 511 Delta Roger AV 094 underscore 07 511 Delta Flight control, LC. Go ahead, this flight control. We have a go to load contingency file, adjust, underscore AB094, underscore. So right zero. now, the new uh, software is being loaded, loaded inside the Atlas V to uh, counter the upper level winds that we have. So maybe they are looking forward for, you know, a lift off at around 6.30 p.m. EDT. Let's see.
वाओ दी एस्टिमेटेड क्लियर टाइम फॉर दी एनुअल क्लाउड्स हैव बीन एक्सटेंडेड टू सिक्स फोर्टी फाइव नाउ तो नोप थिंग्स आर नॉट लुकिंग गुड एंड सिंस दे आर एक्सटेंडिंग एंड एक्सटेंडिंग एंड मूविंग ऑन टू डिटरेटिंग वेदर कंडीशंस नोप आई डोंट थिंक सो इट विल लॉन्च टुडे ऑल्डो हाई हैव सीन वेरियस लॉन्चेस वेर इन द uh probability of go was like 20% and then they literally launched in the launch window I'm so i'm going to hand it back to will overick for a status hey andrea it's like we keep pushing the snooze button waiting for today tonight's launch right i have a little bit of an update from my colleagues over at the 45th weather squadron satellite imagery continues to show that anvil cloud sitting overhead and this live shot that you see right now shows that anvil cloud perfectly over complex 41 and unfortunately it just doesn't want to move now originally we were evaluating that cloud under the attached anvil cloud rule because it was attached to its parent thunderstorm that thunderstorm has since dissipated so we're now evaluating it under the detached anvil cloud rule Unfortunately that doesn't really change the status that we're in. We are in a no go status for the detached anvil rule with an updated clear time of 6:45 p.m. So we still have at least another 15 20 minutes to go before we can start thinking about uh, setting that new T0. So that's all I've got for now. I'll throw it back to you in the studio. Okay so there you have it guys you just heard him they have extended the time to 6:45 now uh, that is the time where you can say the another weather briefing will happen and then uh, uh, after Thanks, that briefing they Wondering will Wondering how you can see the Atlas the V new T0 USSF12 This visibility map shows when and where your best chances are to see the rocket as it launches from Cape Canaveral So uh, space man uh many exact if you live nearby you can now see uh from uh, uh maybe from your location if you can see the launch today if it happens at all so yeah uh, people are there on the beach side to view the launch but uh, things are not looking good though uh, yeah they'll have to wait for quite a long time so we have instructions from uh, mr uh, tori bruno himself dang it and will clouds are parked on top of the pad everybody just take a deep breath and exhale on face e face east and exhale so that those clouds can move <laughs> it's a good way to move the clouds right so everybody living nearby please please do as directed take a deep breath face east and exhale and help in moving that big and will cloud out of the way today
while we are still waiting to clear the Anvil Cloud rule, a new upper-level wind profile has been loaded into the Atlas V rocket's onboard computer, and the upper-level winds are now green. I'm going to toss it back to Will Ulrich for more details on the weather. Hey, Andrea, that's great news about the upper-level winds. Now, that means all that we're left with is continuing to monitor the detached anvil rule. And I wanted to bring up GR Analyst, which is one of the tools that we use at the 45th Weather Squadron to evaluate current radar imagery. Now, what you're looking at right now is called radar reflectivity, and it shows the cloud of concern at approximately 20 to 30,000 feet. This is that detached anvil cloud rule that my colleagues at the 45th Weather Squadron are actively evaluating. Now, the good news is that that cumulus cloud is, or that uh, detached anvil cloud is beginning to dissipate. If I put it forward into time, notice how that cloud is gradually thinning out. And that's what we need to look for in order to get us out of that detached anvil rule. So I do expect an update from my colleagues here soon. We may be able to clear that detached anvil rule uh, for much longer. And really, if we're green on upper level winds, we're not really concerned with anything else at this point. And I do think we have a shot to launch uh, later today. Back to you.
we have another weather update. I'm going to send it over again to Will Ulrich. Hey, Andrea. Just heard from my colleagues at the 45th Weather Squadron over at the Morrell Operations Center, and we are extending the no-go status on that detached anvil cloud rule for a little bit longer. And one of those reasons is because that cloud, though it is dissipating, it's still above the limit that we monitor to ensure that cloud does not pose a threat for rocket-triggered lightning. So the clouds that you see there over Cape Canaveral are moving in the correct direction. They are slowly moving from the west to the east. And even though they're moving very slowly, they're also dissipating at the same time. So so long as we continue to see that trend, and we still have about an hour and 10 to an hour and 15 minutes left in the window, the trend is our friend. And we're hopeful that that cloud will get out of here in time so that we can launch just after 7 PM. I'll provide an update as soon as I hear. Back to you guys. LC, LD, Channel 1. Go, LD. Please coordinate a new T0 with the range 231500Z. Roger, 231500Z. ALC, LC. Go ahead. Please set the clock for 2315000T0. Roger. RC, LC. RC on 1. Please coordinate with the range new T0 2315000. Roger. So, I guess we have a new launch time. Uh, launch Director James uh, Wellen has instructed the time team to coordinate a new launch time of 7.15 EDT. So, we are not so far away from the launch. Uh, so, we do have a launch time now. And uh, right now, I can definitely say... 
15 Zulu. Clock is at L minus 23 and counting. Roger. Piper right, team will pick up at L minus 16 on uh, CT1. Start giving us a time max at that time. LC, RC, net one. Go RC. The range has approved our new T0 time of 23 colon 15 colon 00 Z. Roger. All right, team, uh, T0 is approved. And we are counting. All right, let me just, just set the time. Oh, minus 23 minutes. As you just heard, a new T0 has been set for 7.15 p.m. Eastern Time. Okay, so we are T minus 22 minutes from the launch. Everything is looking good. We are looking good for the clouds and we are looking good for there are no issues obviously on the rocket. The weather was an issue, but now things are looking good. T minus 22 minutes until the liftoff. Range director has given uh, the go for the launch. And right now the vehicle is just topping off all the liquid oxygen. And uh, yes, the vehicle is in ready state to uh, continue the countdown and uh, get ready to lift off at uh, 7 30 EDT okay so <clears throat> that is a good news that is a great news I must say T minus 21 minutes and counting We've created a short tour of our launch locations here in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Let's take a look around. Missions launch to every planet in the solar system, as well as critical national security, science, weather and communication satellites. ULA has established a long-standing reputation for reliability and orbit accuracy in the space launch industry. At our launch site in Cape Canaveral, Florida, the story begins with ULA's Atlas and Delta rockets arriving on the RS rocket ship. The rocket ship is a specially designed cargo ship used to transport rockets from ULA's 1.6 million square foot production facility in Decatur, Alabama. Rocket ship is large enough to carry a complete Delta IV heavy rocket. That's three boosters, a second stage, and a payload fairing. Once loaded, rocket ship departs ULA's dock and travels through the Tennessee River, then onto the Ohio and Mississippi Rivers, then goes out into the Gulf of Mexico. From there, the ship travels through the Atlantic Ocean, around the southern tip of Florida, and north to Port Canaveral. Rocket ship was designed with several features to ensure successful delivery, including the ability to adjust its draft for shallow water and rudderless steering, which minimizes the need to tug. Atlas V boosters are transported from the ship to the high bay in the Atlas Space Flight Operations Center, or ASOC, for final preparations. Delta IV boosters are moved to the Horizontal Integration Facility, or HIF, where they are mated together to form the Delta IV heavy configuration. With final checks completed, the boosters are transported to the launch pad for Launch Vehicle on Stand, or LVOS. The 107 foot long Atlas V boosters are brought to Space Launch Complex 41 and are hoisted into a vertical position using a crane and placed under the Mobile Launch Platform, or MLP, in the Vertical Integration Facility, or VIF. Delta IV heavy rockets are raised vertically by a fixed pad erector at Space Launch Complex 37. The fixed pad erector uses a single hydraulic piston to rotate the boosters 90 degrees inside the Mobile Service Tower, or MST. 
LVOS is followed by the addition of solid rocket boosters, and then the second stage. Next comes Wet Dress Rehearsal, or WDR, which is an end-to-end -end launch simulation from fueling through spacecraft separation. Meanwhile, the ULA team is also working simultaneously to help the customer encapsulate their payload into the rocket's payload fairing. The encapsulated payload fairing is the final piece to be mated to the rocket. With the rocket stack complete, the spacecraft team tests all of the interfaces with the rocket and the launch pad. Once the rockets are completely assembled, final launch preps begin. For Atlas V rockets, launch countdown begins with moving the rocket from the VIF to the pad. The quarter-mile trip uses six components to complete the 20-minute trip. Weighing in at about 2 million pounds, the MLP supports the rocket and contains air conditioning, electrical, and commodities, while the undercarriages bear the weight of the MLP and rocket. Two rail cars lead the move, with the payload van providing communication to the payload, while the ground van houses the ground support for the rocket. At the rear of the convoy, the portable environmental control system provides air conditioning to the payload and rocket. Finally, track mobiles provide the power to move the 3.5 million pound convoy. For Delta IV heavy rockets, the process looks quite different. Approximately nine hours before T0, final preparations begin as 40 hydraulic cylinders at pressures nearing 3,500 PSI move the 10 million pound MST. It's first raised eight inches and then rolled back. Delta uses a carriage transporter system, traveling at about a quarter mile per hour. It takes about 25 minutes to roll the MST to its launch position, 345 feet north of the Delta IV rocket. The Delta IV rocket stands 217 feet tall, or about 21 stories, and weighs more than 900,000 pounds fully fueled. On the day of launch, nearly 30 engineers and managers are polled for system status and readiness to proceed. Status check to proceed with terminal count, Atlas systems, propulsion. This is the final status yeah. check before final. launch for all yeah. Atlas and Delta Manage. vehicle systems, no. ground Hello. systems, the spacecraft, Go. and the U.S. Air Force Go. Eastern Center Range. System. The vehicle system Go. readiness poll Go. includes electrical Go. systems, Go. hydraulics, Go. pneumatics, Go. propulsion Go. systems, flight Anomaly control, G. and propellers. Go. Range coordinator, clear to proceed. Launch director. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. Mission director. This is the mission director. You have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. If the rocket is ready for flight and the weather is within the launch commit criteria, then polling will be completed and the team will have given the go for launch. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. There's ignition. And liftoff of the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. For a typical Atlas V flight, the main engine and solid rocket boosters ignite to lift the rocket off the pad. Shortly after liftoff, the rocket begins a pitch over to attain the proper flight path, minimizing the dynamic pressure the vehicle experiences during flight. Within the first few minutes of flight, the vehicle reaches Mach 1 at the speed of sound, followed by jettison of the solid rocket boosters. About four minutes later, Propellant levels deplete and the booster engine shuts down, followed by release of the booster stage. At various times in flight, depending on the mission, the vehicle jettisons its payload fairing. From there, the second stage will continue carrying the spacecraft towards its destination with planned engine starts and stops. Finally, Centaur will release the spacecraft in its target orbit to continue its journey. So that was quite an informative video I must say that um, uh, T minus 14 minutes from the launch uh, still weather is looking good uh, re regarding updates do we have any uh, okay nope nothing as such we have an update on the weather I'm going to hand it back to okay. Will Rick for a status Hey Andrea, some really good news. Those clouds that you see on satellite behind me continue to thin and I just got word from the meteorologists over at the 45th Weather Squadron that we are now go for the detached anvil rule and that means we're go on all lightning launch commit criteria. So good news, we are progressing well towards that 7 p.m. liftoff time. All things are go from weather.
Back to you guys. Okay, so we we are the weather is LC, go LC, for LC, the launch. Now uh, you will hear the uh, uh, load uh, contingency adjust file. Go no go pull uh, shortly, and uh, if that is successful, I mean, if we get a go from all the departments, this rocket will lift off, and finally it will go to its uh, intended orbit, which is a geostationary orbit, the most difficult to go to. LCRC. Nine seven Charlie Charlie. Roger and work. T minus thirteen Roger. minutes and counting. And for a team, we will hold off on IFPS transfer to L and perform that at L minus nine minutes. Flight is dedicated to Dr. Vladimir Shabanov, Carl Thrillkild, and Rochelle Wunderlich. Dr. Vladimir Shabanov was directly involved in the creation and modifications of rocket engines for much of the latter Soviet period, and has long been considered the father of the RD-180 engine, having directly supervised its design. This engine has successfully launched all Atlas III and Atlas V rockets, and USSF-12 is the 100th launch of an RD-180 powered booster. Not only was he an accomplished scientist, he was also well respected by his colleagues at ULA and by our customers. His personable nature made him approachable by all who interacted with him. Carl Threlkeld began his career at the Rocket Ranch in September 1997. A veteran of the Delta II, Delta IV, Atlas V, and Vulcan programs, Carl was an inspector responsible for the integrity of our products, the safety of our team, and ultimately the satisfaction of our customers. Carl always demonstrated professionalism tinged with wit that kept all smiling with his jokes and antics. He never met a stranger. Rochelle Wunderlich began her aerospace career with Pratt & Whitney in 2001. She recently celebrated her 19th year of combined service with Pratt & Whitney and Aerojet Rocketdyne. Rochelle was an outstanding engineer that understood her products and her team. Her efforts at maintaining supplier quality were key to keeping the RL-10 flying successfully for nearly two decades. Earlier this year, she posthumously received the Palm Beach County Engineering Council Merit Award. She remains loved by many and will be deeply missed by all who knew her. All communications switch to Channel 1. All personnel and visitors remain in present position until launch. Maintain operational silence in the LCC. L minus 10 minutes. Terminal count briefing. If a condition exceeds a launch constraint, any time after a terminal count status check, the observer shall announce hold, hold, hold on channel one, identify their station, and briefly state the reason for the hold. Flight control, perform launch on time verification. Flight control. Roger. OSM, place SRB ignition SNA switch in enable position. LC the slide control. Go. Contingency file add just underscore AV094 underscore zero, zero 08 with SDLCRC97 Charlie Charlie has been verified and loaded into the Inca. Roger. LD LC. LD on channel one. Permission to enable IFPS. Roger. Proceed. L minus nine minutes. Flight control enable WFOV IFPS report complete. This is Atlas Mission Control at T minus four minutes in holding. The team is still working towards a seven fifteen PM Eastern launch. SNA 
switch and enable position. SR bring ignition enabled. Box 2, verify CISA purge blowing GN2 to the CISA. Verified. OSM, verify the FCO, ROC, and OSM whole fire switches are in the proceed position. Ready to proceed. RLM, verify redline monitor and vent table are in the correct configuration for terminal count. Verified. RC, verify saw radiation acceptable for launch. Verified. WFOV IV IFPS enabled. Roger. CRTD, begin telemetry verifications. LC, Sierra TD, we can confirm 33.04 volts. Roger. And flight control looking for your launch on time verification. Roger, and we're. L minus eight minutes. We remain in the hold as we continue towards liftoff. In a few minutes, launch conductor Scott Barney will pull the launch team for the final go to pick up the countdown. 29 engineers and managers are pulled for system status and readiness to proceed. This is a final status check for all Atlas vehicle systems, ground systems, spacecraft, and the U.S. Space Force Eastern Range. The vehicle system readiness pull includes electrical systems, hydraulics, pneumatics, propulsion systems, flight control, and propellants. Let's listen in as Scott Barney performs the final polling. All steps are complete prior to the status check. LC, switch to ready position. L minus seven minutes. Status check to proceed with terminal count. Atlas systems, propulsion. Go. Hydraulics. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. Water. Go. Centaur systems, propulsion. Go. Pneumatics. Go. LO2. Go. LH2. Go. Has gas. Go. Electrical systems, airborne. Go. Ground. Go. Facility. Go. RFFTS. Go. Flight control. Go. GC cube. Go. Operation support. Go. Com. Go. Umbilicals. Go. ECS. Go. Redline monitor. Go. Quality. Go. Ops safety manager. Go. ULA safety officer. Go. Vehicle system engineer. Go. Anomaly chief. Go. Range coordinator. Clear to proceed. Launch director. Stand by. Awaiting uh, POLs for winds. Roger. I will hold prior to coming out of the count. <laughs> Another twist in the story? Let's see. Launch director is yet to give the permission to the launch, for the launch. And anyway. LD, LC, that one? LD. Are you expecting uh, to get a, a clear in the next uh, minute and a half? Yes, we are. This is the LD. Launch vehicle is ready to launch. There you Roger. go. Mission director. Mission director, you have permission to launch. Proceeding with the count. And ALC, verify T0 is set, is set for 2315000. Verified. And there you have it, guys. CRTD, verified. We are go for the launch. The Atlas is ready. The payload is com <laughs> ready. And the weather is green. Range is holding up. From T minus four minutes until launch, you will be listening to Scott Barney and his team performing the final steps in the countdown procedure. Several critical activities occur in the final minutes before launch, including verifying fuel tank levels and pressures in the booster and centaur and arming the flight termination system. At T minus 25 seconds, you'll hear Go Atlas, Go Centaur, Go USSF 12. This is a final status check of Atlas, Centaur, and USSF 12 readiness. At T minus three seconds, the main engine ignites, followed by ignition of the solid rocket boosters. Then after seeing the Atlas V lift off the launch pad, you'll begin hearing flight commentator Patrick Moore providing ascent data as the rocket makes its way to orbit. Cool, so we are T minus four minutes and 20 seconds in counting. Uh, finally, the weather is, weather gods have come down. We are go for the launch because for the weather, for the rain, this is everything Atlas is Mission green. Control at T minus four minutes and holding. We anticipate releasing the hold in just a few moments. Two, one, mark. Three fifty nine. Transferring ring to internal power. Roger. Three fifty five. Ground pyro is enabled. The countdown clock is resumed, and we are go for launch at seven fifteen p.m. Eastern. 
With liftoff approaching, we're going to raise the volume on our launch team so you can hear the final preps. Okay, after such a long wait, we are good for the launch now. Finally, it is happening, guys. T minus 3 minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Weather gods are, are good for us right now. The Atlas is looking good and the range is good. The range is green. There are no wavered ships or anything like that. And we hope, let's hope there are uh, not any during the launch too. So that was an all uh, school looking clock. Um, Yeah, you can say that. Uh, you know, these mission control rooms, once they are constructed, it's very hard to upgrade them because when will you upgrade them, right? Uh, you know, you need to have some renovation time. You can't just shift the whole department from the mission control room to some other place. So, um, yeah, that mission control room is kind of hard to upgrade. It's, you need to have a, like a very off season uh, for uh, the mission control to upgrade to some, you know, um, recent tech so yeah there you go t minus two minutes and 20 seconds remaining everything is looking good so this let me just recap it for you this is an atlas 5541 config rocket uh which means there will be four solid rocket boosters and one centaur upper stage this is carrying the ussf 12 mission which means uh uh two satellites the wild field view test bed satellite which has three to five years of uh, uh, lifetime and then there is a ring satellite a uh, ring uh, um, um, um payload uh ussf 12 ring payload which is supposed to be working like a cube uh, like cubesat deploy but in that case that's that's not a cubesat deploy but a proper satellite deployer because each sat can have uh, like uh, 350 kilograms of uh, a satellite so uh, it is going to geostationary orbit not a geostationary transfer orbit proper geostationary orbit and uh, t minus okay, one minute remaining ECS count started 115 reduce ecs for launch roger 110 vent valves locked liquid oxygen t minus one pressed. minute Green. This is happening, guys. Finally, this is happening. Forty seconds. T minus 30 seconds remaining. 28. Verify. ECS reduced for launch. Verified. 25. Status check. Go Atlas. Go Centaur. Go USS. T minus 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, T minus 10, 10 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, ignition. two, one. We have engine lift ignition off. and lift off of Whoa. the United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. Just look at USSF that. USSF-12 for the United States Space Force. Pitch over program body range look good. There she goes. Up, up, and beyond. Wow. Seconds into flight. Atlas is now completing the pitch over maneuver. Body range continue to look good. Finally, she Are is off the bat. Bit of partial thrust. Response looks good. Now 36 seconds into flight. Atlas 5 is now passing Mach 1. Just look at that Party camera. Party 180 continue to look good in partial thrust mode. Seeing good chamber pressures on all SRBs. Mach 1 is achieving. And 49 seconds into flight. Max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. There you go. Max Q Party has been achieved. Party operating parameters continue to look good. SRB chamber pressures also look good. Now passing one minute into flight. Wow, that was surreal. Party 180 now throttling back up to full thrust as expected. 
now the next event is dsrb jettison and that jettison will happen after the burnout and in um, sequence chamber pressure and we can see the, the SRBs paint coming good. off Party wow and just look at that uh, srb there the paint is coming now off because 23 seconds in the flight approximately it is exposed to the vacuum we can see the paint coming off now and at this point in the flight atlas 5 now weighs just one half of its liftoff weight wow and see srb chamber pressure is tailing off now and we have SRB burnout. That'd be One minute, 45 seconds into flight. RD 180 engine operating parameters continue to look good. There you go, first and the second. And wow. we have jettison of all four solid rocket boosters. Vehicle has gone to closed loop steering. Body rate responses look good. Just past two minutes into flight now. Closed loop guidance has been initiated, which means it is taking the feedback RD into account. Already throttling down slightly as expected. Engine operating parameters continue to look good. Just look at that plume. And two minutes now remaining in the boost phase of flight. Wow. Look at that earth. The clouds. Atlas 5 is now 50 miles in altitude, 78 miles downrange distance, traveling at 5,000 miles per hour. Clouds are actually thick. You can see those RD clouds in the operating background. Operating parameters continue to look good. Vehicle body rates looking good throughout boost days. Next event is the payload fairing separation, which will. And the Centaur reaction control system is now pressurizing to flight level. System response looks good. Happen in few seconds. Coming up on three minutes into flight. RD-180 now throttling to maintain a constant 2.5 g acceleration limit. Seeing good response on the RD-180. Body rates continue to look good throughout boost phase. Wow. Look at that sun and the earth. Now passing three minutes, 20 seconds into flight. This Approximately is one some minute now view. remaining until Biko. Fairing separation confirmed. Those flappy, flappy fairings are down now. Those rings. And we have good indication of payload fairing jettison and CFLR deck jettison. There you go. The rings have been jettisoned. Centaur is exposed to vehicles now throttled back up slightly. Now. Engine response continues to look good. No, we want to see the onboard camera views. And RD-180 now throttling to maintain a constant 4.6G acceleration limit in preparation for Biko. Yep. Thank and you so much. Space chill down. Just look at those Passing views. Four minutes into flight. Wow. Vehicle systems all continue to operate nominally throughout boost phase. Body rates continue to look good. RD-180 engine operating parameters continue to look good as it maintains that acceleration limit. And we have... Standing by for BECO shortly. And we have BECO booster engine cutoff. Standing by for stage set. BECO done. And we have good indication of stage separation. Wow, just look at that stage separation. And we restart on the RL-10, standing by for ignition. We have ignition on RL-10 now. We have ignition and full thrust on the RL-10. Chamber pressure looks good. Body rates look good. Oh, wow. Center is closed loop steering. Body rates continue to look good. Now five minutes into flight. RL-10 chamber pressure continues to look good. Body rates look good. This first burn of today's mission will last approximately 6 minutes, 18 seconds. This is Atlas Mission Control at T plus 5 minutes and 14 seconds. We just heard flight commentator Patrick Moore confirm the successful completion of the early phase of today's flight and all systems continue to operate nominally. Our next event, Centaur Main Engine Cutoff, will occur in approximately 6 minutes. As we approach our next milestone, we'd like to share a recent conversation with U.S. Space Force's Colonel Heather Bogsty. Thanks for Hi, joining in, Louis Smith. Colonel Heather Bogsty, the Senior Material Leader for the Resilient Missile Warning, Missile Tracking, and Missile Defense Acquisition Delta from the Space Sensing Directorate at Space Systems Command in Los Angeles Air Force Base, California. At Space Systems Command, we are focused on the threat. And right now, we are at unprecedented times where the threat is coming at us faster than ever, with dimmer targets that we are currently working to detect better. 
The launch of the USS F-12 and wide field of view will really help shape how we implement our architecture moving forward and get after that threat. We are working with the Space Development Agency and the Missile Defense Agency in a combined program office to have an integrated missile warning architecture that will soon pivot away from GEO towards the MEO and LEO layers on orbit. The data from wide field of view will help pathfind and demonstrate what technologies we want to use in the future. Wide field of view has a 4K by 4K focal plane. With this, we'll be able to see a larger area of the Earth than ever before, over 3,000 plus kilometers at any one time. It also has a tactical cryo cooler, which has been used in the air domain, and now we're eager to see how it will be applied to the space domain. If this works, we can see significant cost savings as we scale up our architecture in the future. Another way that Wide Field of View is gonna be helping us is with data exploitation. We're performing data exploitation out of our TAP lab in Boulder, Colorado, and the team there is really looking at how do we enhance our algorithms to really uh, refine the battle space characterization and uh, missile warning capabilities that we currently have. Wide Field of View is really gonna help demonstrate that moving forward. It's also gonna help us operationalize the data and get it integrated into the integrated tactical warning attack and assessment architecture that we're currently seeing with the Sibbers missions. We're very eager for the upcoming launch of Sibbers Geo-6, as it will be the second OPR spacecraft in a very short duration of time, really making our missile warning capability more robust than ever. We'd like to thank all of our mission partners and industry partners that have helped us to get to this point so far. Millennium Space Systems for the integration of the payload and the bus development, L3 Harris for the payload, United Launch Alliance for helping launch our satellite into orbit, for the Space Dynamics Laboratory for the data exploitation and algorithm development, our partners at the Aerospace Corporation, and our partners at NASA Ames. Without all of them, this would not be possible, and we're very eager to see all the amazing capabilities that Wide Field of View is gonna to bring to orbit. Go Wide Field of View. We are a couple minutes away from Miko one While we wait, we thought it would be fun to share the results from the rounds of trivia we hosted earlier for our ULA Twitter account. Great job to all who are participated and who were first to correctly answer each question. Okay, we're gonna get into the trivia questions now. Question one. Before today's mission, what was the most recent payload launched by an Atlas V 541 rocket? And the answer is, ULA successfully launched the GOES T Weather Observatory for NOAA and NASA in March from Cape Canaveral, Florida. Question number two How many U.S. national security launches has ULA performed in its 150 successful launches to date? And the answer for number two is, ULA has launched 93 national security missions in our first 150 flights, deploying reconnaissance, communications, navigation, and weather site satellites for the nation. Moving on to question number three. How many burns by the Centaur upper stage are planned in tonight's USSF-12 launch? And the answer is, the USSF-12 launch is a direct insertion into geosynchronous orbit one of the most challenging missions required by national security spaceflight. Atlas V will conduct three Centaur burns to reach its destination. Next question, question number four. What is the diameter of the out of autoclave payload fairing protecting the dual USSF-12 payloads during launch? And the answer to this question is, the two satellites riding into space atop this Atlas V rocket are protected during atmospheric flight by the 17.7 foot or 5.4 meter diameter out of autoclave payload fairing. And the final question, question number five, what is the horsepower rating of the Atlas V 541 rocket launching tonight? And the final answer is, the Atlas V 541 rocket unleashed 32 million horsepower to launch USSF-12 mission to geosynchronous orbit. And we have Miko, main engine cutoff. Centaur is now entering a 12-minute coast duration. 
RCS is engaged 100% for us settling as expected. This is Atlas Mission Control at 11, T plus 11 minutes and 21 seconds. Patrick Moore just confirmed successful completion of the first of three Centaur main engine burns. The second main engine burn will occur in approximately 12 minutes. During this time, I have the pleasure of being welcomed by Jason Kim, Millennium, CE, Millennium Space Systems CEO. Jason, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Andrea. Well, I bet you're really excited and relieved to finally see that the weather held out for that launch. That's right. I'm on cloud nine, and I know a lot about clouds now. Yeah, so we know. All anvil does. clouds, chemo yeah. clouds. I'm sure we're all very educated now. Right. Well, um, before we get into the launch, because I know we're just kind of riding high right now on the launch, um, we're actually going to take a look at a video you, sh you sent us about wide field of view. So before we get into our interview, let's take a look. Fantastic. Okay, so guys, finally the Miko has happened. That means the second engine uh, closed um, shut off has happened. There are three burns which has to be performed, uh, and we'll have to wait and see the next one whenever it happens. The advancing and very real threat requires that we expand our focus beyond integrating and fielding a single space system iteratively, while staying far ahead of the threat. We must deliver more resilient, multi-layer systems of systems bring together best of breed operational space technology from across agencies and field affordable capability. We must transform how we execute this mission because threats are constantly evolving. Wide Field of View is a geosynchronous satellite for the U.S. Space Force. It serves as a standalone test bed for missile warning. The satellite will test different ways to collect and report missile launch data and will inform future OPIR programs of record. The program really is a team effort with the Space Force, NASA Ames, and our industry partners. Our two industry partners, Millennium Space Systems and L3 Harris, adopt us as full team members with deaths in their facilities and during critical phases, like the environmental tests we set together. We leverage the expertise of the Naval Research Laboratory Blossom Point Tracking Facility to achieve 24 seven ops with a minimum operator footprint. That's using NRL's automated ground resource management and spacecraft command and control. We've also partnered with NASA Ames for their acquisition and subject matter expertise. Automated ground operations is what gives Blossom Point the capability to track satellites 24 seven with reduced manning. NRL has a long history of tracking satellites. Blossom Point's been here since 1956. Wide Field of View actually fits in with the research and development mission that goes along with Blossom Point. Missile warning and the early detection of ballistic missile threats is critical to our nation and our allies' safety. The Wide Field of View system will enhance our nation's current OPR architecture and capabilities and rapidly incorporate new technologies into future systems. Well, that's a pretty great video, and I know we're going to learn a little bit more about Wide Field of View and Millennium as we get through this interview here. So let's kick it off. So um, as we know, you know, Millennium's very involved in this process. So um, what does it mean for Millennium? So guys, uh, we had a successful liftoff and everything went as per the plan, but it's quite 5 a.m. now, so I have to go and sleep and uh Get ready for another stream in just five hours from now. So I guess I can sign off now. We can actually see the payload from here and uh, see those uh, burns of the RCS burns on the center upper stage. Uh, that uh, wild field of view payload and then the launch adapter and then the ring payload. So right now the mission profile would look like this. There will be another burn. Right now it's in a parking orbit of around, you can see, uh, 200 crews. Uh, 300 kilometers or so and then uh, <clears throat> it will raise this apogee to 36,000 kilometers once that is achieved uh, that would be the second burn once that is achieved it will go to the apogee uh, do the burn to circularize the, uh, for the geosynchronous orbit so uh, this will be the hardest for them to go and uh, uh, yeah hopefully they'll uh, do the their traditional bulls eye mission this time also so until then this is Priyanshu you just saw rocket gun stay safe stay healthy and bye bye